the start. Okay. It's like a cut, whatever, or not cut, uh, start. All right. Um, so welcome to talk. Uh, it's Kotlin Multi-Platform Production. My name is Kevin Galligan. I'm a partner at a company called TouchLab. Um, been coding, you know, for a while. I uh, started on Android before there was a phone. They actually had a contest. I didn't win. Um, also a Kotlin GDE and doing a bunch of Kotlin stuff. Uh, what's TouchLab, you ask? Hold on a second. I have to click on, there we go. Uh, it is a mostly mobile dev shop started ah, a decade ago-ish. Uh, we were mostly Android for most of that time, and we do a bunch of mobile stuff. We still do regular mobile stuff, but we're largely refocused around Kotlin multi-platform as a technology. Hope that works out. So, um, oh, man, the buttons aren't working. <sighs> okay, hold on. There we go. Uh, out of the gate, we were very fortunate to have some great partners. So um, I want to shout out to Square to because uh, we're kind of working together on multi-platform stuff and open source stuff, and it's been so sort of really great. So, um, you know, uh, this is what I've been doing for a lot of this year, uh, working with teams to get into production with multi-platform stuff. So it seemed like a natural topic and submitted it, and then you kind of forget about this stuff, and then all of a sudden the conference is coming up, and you're like, oh, what am I actually talking about? <laughs> and it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, I will say there are a number of things in here that could be their own topics for their own talks or blog posts or perhaps careers. So um, so we're going to kind of you know, whip through this um, and then, uh, you know, go into like things you'll have to think about when you want to introduce KMP into your organization and, and issues you're going to have to deal with. Um, and then kind of a state of where KMP is now, what we can kind of expect on the road, and I'll leave some space for questions at the end, uh, and happy to talk about whatever. So, um, so what is KMP and KMM? I'm gonna give a very quick intro. Um, Kotlin multi-platform, it is a like mechanism by which you can share Kotlin code among many different platforms, right? JVM, obviously, JavaScript, uh, a bunch of native flavors. Um, you have some platform agnostic Kotlin, which isn't a common thing there. And then like a way to integrate it with specific platforms, right? And the reason why this is better than say C++ or like Rust or Lua or whatever, um, the interop. The interop is something they spend a lot of time on uh, to make it really good and smooth. So you can integrate things in a way that is natural for the platform. So um, this looks nice and simple, but it gets really complicated like very quickly. So um, the JVM has a bunch of flavors. JavaScript's got a bunch of stuff going on. Native is like embedded. You know, I could put it in my custom keyboard perhaps if I really felt inclined to put the time in, which I haven't. But um, yeah, it gets really complicated very quickly. So Kotlin uh, KMM, which is, stands for Kotlin Multi-Platform Mobile, um, and we'll have a long talk someday about acronyms perhaps, but uh, it is to simplify the situation somewhat, right? JetBrains has made uh, a focus on native mobile code sharing. And uh, if there's gonna be a, a killer app, which Russell was just talking about in the last talk, um, it's gonna be for native mobile, right? So at least that's what we think. So KMM is mostly a branding designation. It's still KMP at its heart, right? Um, there's a desi uh, dedicated website and docs to help you get started. And there's an Android Studio plugin built for just mobile, although you can still do other things besides mobile, but that's essentially what that's about. And next week I want to highlight, uh, you know, advertising another event at an event is like whatever, but you know, <laughs> um, they're having a big 1.4 um, event that's sort of in lieu of Kotlin Conf. I'm talking about a bunch of this stuff next, next week. So check that out if you're interested. So um, why? Why KMP, KMM? And um, especially for people who kind of <laughs> know my career, like uh, since 2015, I've been on this weird odyssey starting with J2WJC and building an Android ecosystem around that. And then uh, KMP transitioned a few years ago. Um, I've had a lot of time to think about why. And this is like my condensed definition of what distinguishes KMP from other technology, right? Optional, uh, as in you can do a little bit, you can do a lot, natively integrated, like it works directly with the native platform. It's not some like hands off like kind of thing open source, which is like table stakes for 2020 um, code sharing platform. It is not cross platform, right? Based on the modern, I'm like, uh, my screen is being cut off with other things from Zoom, uh, popular modern language Kotlin. It is important. If you have this really obscure language, it can be great, but you know, uh, not super um, popular. 
Anyway, it facilitates non-UI logic availability on many platforms, right? And I never really found a good place to stick this in here, but it's, uh, it's sort of obvious and also critically important that there is an org that is sort of the best of its game building tools that is also financially invested in making this work, right? When people are like, why not Swift for Android? I'm like, well, where's the JetBrains in the Apple world? It doesn't exist. Apple doesn't care about Swift working on Android and you need some organization that's really invested in making that work. So anyway, um, shared code or shared native code. And this is kind of the way to pitch it. It's not cross-platform because cross-platform is like a ruined term in our world. Um, and also another thing that I like to point out is on the Android side, Kotlin is what you use. It's like half of a cross-platform solution, right? On the Android side, it's just what you would use anyway. The iOS side, yeah, it's objective C interface. It's a little weird, kinda, but still it's a much better thing relative to the other options that are out there. So, um, <laughs> so I just, I saw the chat too. Everything's going on now, it's crazy. So uh, not necessarily UI, right? Uh, and this is important when you're talking to folks that are native developers. You know, you can still use Compose. You can still use Swift UI. These are not gonna be things that are incompatible to technology. Is there gonna be Compose for iOS? Sure, eventually. There, there's like, you know, commits about desktop Compose. Um, we'll see how it goes. I don't know how good it's gonna be, but hopefully good. Um, but the whole point is you're not locked into this thing. And that's comparison to like, no offense, Flutter or React Native. Um, you have to like totally throw everything out and then use this new thing. And that's not true of a shared code solution. So, uh, and low risk. And as we go out and talk to orgs, um, the larger the org, the more the risk is, is part of the conversation. You know, if it's a couple of developers, they might be interested in trying something totally new. If you've got 50 folks working on multiple apps, legacy apps, you know, introducing an entirely new uh, technology that's going to have to like be rewritten is not something people are interested in doing. So it's a big deal. Anyway, yada, yada. So um, production, who's in production now? Um, I made a quick list. The interesting thing was like a year or two ago, if anybody was in production, you would hear about it. Um, now it's like, if you don't write a blog post, you don't know, because it's just shared code, right? But you know, Cache Square, obviously, Plan Grid, Kareem, Quizlet, Down Dog, it's a yoga app, just found out a few weeks ago, it's pretty neat. Um, Target, VMware, the rest, uh, there's a bunch. People are definitely, putting it into production and you're starting to see it like casually so like they're not writing blog posts and making announcements about it um uh, and particle just mentioned them because they're actually shipping a library generator it's an analytics company and they're generating libraries based on kotlin multi-platform and then being able to send them around we'll talk about that a little bit later not them specifically but analytics um <laughs> I just had to pull this slide. I had a slide about the thing I've been working on for the past several days. Like we got busy enough, I had to scrub in and like <laughs> work on something. So uh, I was told, don't apologize. I'm not apologizing, but usually my slides, I obsess with them weeks over, you know, going up to a conference, they're usually more images and I'm more like polished, but I've ran out of time. <laughs> anyway, we have an app actively going into production uh, and we were up late last night doing around the world, crazy COVID stuff. So it was pretty interesting. Anyway. Um, it's super cool. We'll announce it at some point whenever we get official permission. Um, yada, yada. People are putting in production. It is happening. So how do you get started? Um, as mentioned, Kotlin Multi-Platform Mobile is a dedicated website that's helping to get started with docs, examples, libraries, links to other teams in production, which I looked at right before this talk and I realized I missed you know, quite a few. Um, I still would advise taking a look at our camp kit also. This is a library that we made, it's an app that we made. And the reason was, uh, if you went and Googled getting started with Flutter or getting started with React Native, um, you'd find a nice thing that would five, 10 minutes later, you would be running and have like running code. And a year ago, if you did that with Kotlin multi-platform, three hours later, you'd still be trying to figure out what's wrong with your Gradle. Like no offense, but it was very deep dive things. So we wanted something you'd start with with a reasonable library architecture so go check out camp Kit. we're going to maintain that you know until something completely usurps that 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 need um yeah so <laughs> it's a lot of chatter okay uh so production uh question mark this seems like an intro talk to me I'm getting there let's get a little more into the weeds we've got past the intro stuff so um tooling and this is where we're going to talk a little more about where we at like today 
and where do I think we're going to be in the near future and down the road. So like today, um, and for the past several years, I still would say, if you're going to get started now, IntelliJ is still kind of the safe choice. And that's because the Kotlin plugin and the Gradle plugin around Kotlin are still kind of developed in lockstep and they still seem to be most compatible with IntelliJ. Um, that will change soon, I'm sure. But for today, I, think, I, th I still think that's true. Um, there is the Android Studio plugin. This is cool, but it's new, right? I think they're at 0.3 currently. Uh, I haven't played with it a ton. I know that there are templates, which are very useful to get started. Um, there is like debugging. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but I'm hoping, you know, maybe next week when they're pushing more stuff out, we'll get some more stable stuff. But it's still a little loosey-goosey here and there. No offense. It's great. But I'm really excited about it because it's clear that JetBrains, it's another indication that they are financially and, you know, as a team invested in making this technology work. So if you're selling this into something, it'll be, um, I think this will help. On the other hand, I, I don't see this as being a single, single IDE situation um, as, as like imperative, like this is necessity, right? Uh, and this is why we have, you know, focused on this Xcode plugin, which is in Xcode, you get Kotlin source highlighting and you get like Kotlin debugging for, like from a running iOS app. Um, and I think that this is gonna be, you know, useful ongoing. Uh, in a lot of cases, <clears throat> especially if you have people on your team, iOS focused developers don't necessarily wanna install JVM, Android Studio, all this stuff. They wanna start with like a read mostly situation. This is useful. Um, all these things use LLDB. So I will say as of today, um, LLDB deep in the weeds, but for debugging, there's a Python script that, that goes into the memory and does stuff. And we took the stock one from Kotlin native and we did a lot of optimizations for the Xcode plugin and then pushed that back. And they took some optimizations and we're kind of trying to merge everything, but there's been a little bit of regressions. So uh, I made a little video today, which kind of takes forever to run. This is like real time, how long it takes to get information about each variable. So <laughs> over the next few weeks, um, we're gonna like try to reintroduce some of these optimizations and push them back like into the thing. But if you're debugging now, you gotta bear in mind that like, if you have an array, it's gonna try to make a string deep, like two string of that entire array. So it takes like forever for each step. So just be wary. It doesn't work a hundred percent great, but no offense. <laughs> I'm assuming it'll be great in a few weeks. Anyway, uh, crash reporting. So right now, if you are running Kotlin in your app as a shared code solution in iOS, um, iOS and like it's Swift and Objective-C, the way that they propagate errors works different than the way Kotlin does. So right now, if you get a crash, It'll look like this in Crash Lytics. And what you really want is this, which is symbolicated lines. So um, I know at this point, you're probably thinking like, Kevin's just gonna talk about all the touch lab libraries all day. But the truth is, <laughs> uh, we've been doing this for a while. So like we have this library, which helps, um, it works for Crash Lytics and Bugsnag currently. Um, there's a lot more kind of like attention I wanna put into it later to make it a little more integrated, but it does work and it uses essentially just takes what the Kotlin native team did to expose uh, function pointers and sends that appropriately to the crash reporting um, endpoints. Uh, currently, we're kind of negotiating with Sentry because theirs doesn't support that what we need. Uh, we'll probably have to figure out new relics soon because the client is demanding, so we'll see. But uh, definitely, you're gonna need this and it helps like quite a bit to have the symbolicated lines and all that stuff. Great, so uh, package manager. <laughs> I was gonna talk more about this. But in the last like several weeks, um, it's tricky. Once you go from beyond like simple um, application samples into like what an iOS team would expect as far as CocoaPods versus Carthage, uh, Swift Package Manager, it gets tricky. I don't have a lot to say here yet. I'm gonna talk a bit about that a little later. Uh, I will say prepare to roll up your sleeves and get into the weeds because it's going to be a little messy. And it's actually, I thought it would be a little more clear by this talk and actually working with clients has become less clear. Um, not to doom and gloom, but there you go. And then the JS stuff, we haven't even done this really yet internally, uh, but in talking to teams, um, publishing libraries for internal teams, it, it's kind of a roll your own situation. TypeScript still is kind of supported, but needs some work. This is all secondhand information, but 
we're planning on getting into this in the near future too, because I think this is going to be quite useful for certain teams. All this is kind of leading towards larger teams, just FYI. Um, if it's like two people at a startup working on something, it's a totally different situation. But that's my info. That's what I'm giving you. All right. So uh, libraries. Now, um, that was part of my write-up for this talk. So I was like, I need a section on libraries. And then I realized that Russell from TouchLab also was giving a talk right before this talk about libraries. So <clears throat> I left this kind of blank. Um, I would say what we're using in production largely tracks with what we have in CampKit, right? So SQL Delight, you know, obviously that's the database uh, of choice. And uh, we did like a kind of a version of coin for multi-platform. We're using that in stately and multi-platform settings from Russell and things like that. Um, we are probably going to start putting out example apps outside of CampKit because we don't want to make CampKit too opinionated. We want to have sort of, this is what you might use without too many opinions. And then we want to start putting out Compose, Swift UI, John O'Reilly uh, did People in Space and some other apps you should check out. They're pretty cool. He's also testing out, there's like a new like uh, document database from uh, this company Coding Coders. They do coding, but they also have a database. Uh, so it's interesting, there's stuff coming out. But, uh, this is largely what we use what's in CampKit. So um, what's missing? And this is kind of the bad news section. And I'm not sure that <laughs> I watched Russell's talk, but I had to knock off a little early. Um, there are things that are missing in this ecosystem. So uh, the new compiler plugin situation will help. But uh, right now, writing compiler plugins is non-trivial, and I don't think the, the API is stable. So right now, there's no mocking, right? That's just like not a thing. Um, there's coin and coding, you know, as mentioned, but there's nothing like Dagger. There is a date library, but there's no localization. So there's no real parsing. There's no formatting. Um, that kind of stuff. There's no like real file API. So that's kind of the bad news. And like in the apps we're doing, we still wind up doing like expect actuals to do date stuff. It's not so bad because the platform is very flexible, but you still kind of have to do it. Right. Um, but as I like to point out, it's a great time to start. If you want to get an open source, the, the ecosystem is still wide open and there's still tons of stuff to do. So, you know, that's my pitch. Well, and we'll see how that goes, but you should check it out. So integrating, um, how to get KMP into your app. And I would say this falls into two rough categories. There is the political and how do you pitch it? And then there's the technical, how do you actually do it? So um, we talk a lot about this too, because we do get brought in like to teams where the Android side is kind of interested. The iOS side is kind of less interested, in, you know, to navigate um that discussion right and i would say people tell me like well this is never going to work because ios devs will never accept it right and my answer to that is like you kind of have to take a step back we're all developers we all kind of have the same approach to things and step one is start with empathy right like when the web team comes and says hey there's this thing called react native so we don't need to do any of this android crap anymore we can just do it all in javascript like there's a range of responses, you know, there's, that's interesting. Let's check it out to like, get out of here. Cross platform sucks, you know, stay in your lane. You know what I mean? Like it ranges and we're all kind of like that. And, and I would say that um, iOS folks are the same as everyone else. So find allies, you know, see if anybody's curious um, and, you know, modifying an iOS build is going to be very difficult if you have no experience. So you're going to need some help. Now, if nobody's interested at all, you're probably gonna have a tough sell, just throwing that out there. But usually I found at least some people are willing to talk, check it out, try some things. Um, modifying like any prod build, not iOS specific. If you're not a web person and you try to modify your production web, like build system, you're gonna be there for a long time just learning basics of like NPM and all that kind of stuff. Uh, same thing with iOS and, and CampKit exists because uh, someone who may be on this call, I saw in Slack earlier, <laughs> um, had a hack week and tried to like put some code into their production app. And I think it, you know, it was most of the week was just figuring out how to integrate stuff. And um, it's good to have help, especially people who know the build system that you're working with. So um, it's also good to brush up on the talking points, right? Like 
um, a lot of times people get into like Flutter versus React Native versus Kotlin, and it's like they're not remotely the same technologies, right? It's not cross-platform. It's good to like stay, keep the argument in a place where it kind of makes sense, right? Um, and just keep, you know, saying, hey, you can still use Swift UI. You know that, right? Okay, cool. So um, <laughs> it's optional sharing, so you can start with like a little bit of integration, and you don't have to do some crazy rewrite. So um, pick something nobody likes. I haven't met a lot of developers who are super jazzed about core data, so maybe do a database library. Or uh, another option we see a lot, again, as mentioned, is analytics. So in particle building that, you know, typed analytics generating library. And that's a good one because, you know, there's not a lot of joy in spending time as a developer on analytics. And it's just a bunch of strings. So it's easy to let that between platforms drip. So having a typed library, good place to start. Anyway, pick something people aren't excited about and provide a library for that. And it's kind of what we found to be pretty use, pretty useful. Um, have a couple links. I'm going to share this slides out, these slides out. Jeez. Um, after the talk, uh, we have a sort of this starter kit that we publish. And then also uh, there's an official doc on the KMAP site talking about this uh, as well. So it's important because if nobody wants this, you're, you're not going to win that, that debate for sure. <laughs> um, actually integrating. This is what I thought in my mind when I pitched the talk that this was going to be about. <laughs> but as mentioned, um, working with clients over the last few months, uh, it's actually been, it's kind of interesting. Like, um, there's a lot of opinions about this and, and it is something that is still very hazy once you get into like real production apps. So what everyone needs is this, right? You've got your shared code, you've got your platform specific code, and you got your apps building stuff. But where you actually keep that shared code is often not a very easy problem to solve, right? So Greenfield is pretty straightforward. And um, good news is it's, it's not really hard to figure out, or maybe like a small mono repo. But, um, you know, the iOS team installs a JVM, has to build a Kotlin. That's just part of it. And all the samples basically are living in this world. But if you get into a larger team or existing like large production app, this is kind of not going to work. And that's a, the issue we're running into often. So um, the first thing everyone talks about doing is shipping a binary. So let's say, you know, if they're using CocoaPods, they might want to say, okay, great. Like carve off a binary from the Android app, you know, make a framework, figure out how to get it to something that we can consume from CocoaPods. And then we're not just, just not going to worry about it. It'd just be some other thing we talk to. Um, this is like good because the iOS developers don't need to install anything. It doesn't extend the build time. It doesn't do anything, you know, negative. Uh, but on the flip side, it doesn't really multiple problems. Like right now, I wouldn't know how you would debug Kotlin code in the iOS app using this technique. And I think more philosophical, you never really start to get the iOS folks to be more mobile folks. It stays as this external thing that you know we have to use, but we don't really get into the the habit of learning Kotlin, right? So um, that was kind of the idea behind the Expo plugin. Why I think it's going to be very important in the long term is that it's a read mostly situation. So you can say hey, to the iOS team, like here's some Kotlin, and you can debug this and you can see how things work, and it's not like forcing an entire new development ecosystem on, right? So uh, we've been exploring this. <coughs> which is, this is the whole thing where I'm like, you could have a, an entire different talk about this whole topic. But um, instead of just an, a, a binary that's you know remote, that's the default. So as an iOS developer, you can just clone the project and not you know have to install anything. But um, you can flip a switch and then you're using CocoaPods to talk to the actual Kotlin code and build a code then you can debug. So we're kind of doing this, but it's still up in the air. And actually one client, we were like totally down this road and then last minute, like, now nah, we're going to do binary only. They want to use Swift Package Manager. It's like, uh, you know. So that's why I was like, I thought I was going to talk about a really cool end, and it turns out it doesn't work for everybody too. So, But look out for that. I think the next year, this is going to be a huge topic, and um, a lot of people are going to talk about it. But it's an important one, right? Once you get into, like, real production apps, this is something you got to do. And not to blatantly advertise, but that's what we do. So <laughs> this is a problem you have to solve. You know, you know where we're at. 
that's what I'm doing essentially day in and day out now. So um, this is the assorted info slash potentially bad news section about today. Um, but it's good info to have. And I'll just throw it out at you. I didn't really <laughs> organize this a lot. I need like a cough button. Damn. All right. Uh, concurrency. If you've been at all paying attention to Kotlin multi-platform, um, you'll know that Kotlin native has a weird concurrency model, quote unquote, weird. And um, I've been talking about this for years because I've been like obsessed with this. And it's very different. Um, it is, has two rules, briefly. Uh, one thread, you can have mutable state, and multiple threads, you can not. It's immutable, frozen, quote unquote. Uh, and that's all I'll say about that. The current, concurrency model is changing. And they're essentially going to abandon that model. I'm not exactly sure what's going to be in its place. It might be just what the JVM has. It might be something in between, but we won't know. And the important thing is that realistically, we won't have a usable model to the second half of next year, for sure. It's in JetBrains timeline to have like preview by March. But if you think about it, we're talking changing the memory model entirely. We're talking about garbage collection. We're talking about Kotlin X coroutines needs to be updated. And that took, I mean, I don't have a timeline. I was going to, I didn't put the slide in. <laughs> uh, it took a long time for multi-threaded coroutines to arrive on Kotlin native already to think about this entirely new model and have that be adapted. It's at least, you know, second half of next year, I would guess, um, if that. So the good news is your code, if you architect it in you know, a reasonably straightforward way, uh, your code will not have to change at all or maybe not much at all, unless you do a lot of concurrency management. Like I wrote the Kotlin native version of coin and I very much embraced the single threaded model. And now that is not necessary. So that hell has to get rewritten. Um, I have a library called Stately that helps with the concurrency model. That's just going to go away. But if you're not writing concurrency management code, uh, it's not that big of a deal. So anyway, here's a bunch of links. Um, the overview, hands-on. Um, I have some thoughts on the changes coming. Deep dive video from Kotlin Conf. Um, these are all actually written by me, <laughs> even the official docs. That gives you a sense of how obsessed I was with the concurrency model. Uh, you know, sometimes you got to change with life. And here we are. Um, you have to learn it if you want to do anything with Kotlin mobile multi-platform before the end of next year. But you don't have to learn everything. And it's not that bad. So that's the answer for that. Kotlin X coroutines. Um, Two libraries. So when Kotlin Native started, you know, we have that odd memory model. There was a Kotlin X coroutines release that was single threaded, which sounds odd to, I think, Android developers, right? Like, isn't it about concurrency? It's like, well, coroutines is really about asynchronous processing. So you can suspend and resume. Um, you can sometimes resume on a different thread, but that's kind of a different discussion. So uh, Kotlin X coroutines in native was single threaded for a long time. And then late last year, um, there was a preview and Roman has been publishing the preview in the library since then in sort of parallel. And up until 1.4, you kind of had to force the multi-threaded version into your app and um, a lot of yada yada, a lot of hilarity ensued. It wasn't a very simple uh, process. And I wrote about that in this blog post as again, uh, a little deep in the weeds, but if you're interested, check it out. Simple answer is um, not a problem anymore. Just use Kotlin 1.4 if you haven't, if you're not on there yet, upgrade. And then just always use the multi-threaded coroutines branch. Uh, eventually, in the not too distant future, the multi-threaded coroutines version is going to be the coroutines version. Um, a lot of caveats, you know, data gets frozen, yada, yada, but that's, uh, that's a different talk. Okay, but that's, anyway, that's the answer to the coroutine situation. It's complicated. Um, <clears throat> another thing you'll run into, especially when talking to um, iOS team, teams, if you have a larger team, um, you can only have one framework um, functionally, one framework uh, as something you import in your iOS app. And this is kind of a big deal with larger teams. So it looks like this. Let's say you have contacts, products, analytics as your three modules and below that like kind of a db module right 
you have to like merge them all into one umbrella framework. And if you, that's the only way you can really make it work. Um, what everyone wants, of course, is this, right? I want to include these different frameworks and have them all, you know, work the way you would normally modular, <coughs> modularize your code. But that won't work. You can kind of do this. This is getting a little bit of weeds again. Go read about it. I'll, I'll post links in a second. Um, you know, things are logically related that need to communicate with each other. They have to be in one framework. But analytics could kind of be in its own. You'll definitely pay overhead for extra binary, um, but it'll work. What's going on under the hood is that the Kotlin compiler is very conservative and it's a very static um, language on native. So it's only giving you whatever you need in the libraries that you're including and everything else gets removed. What it doesn't know is if you're like making another like library, it doesn't know what you needed there. So it essentially makes two copies of everything. Um, binary overhead, these two frameworks can't communicate with each other, but you can kind of do it anyway. That's a long discussion too. Um, we have a uh, blog post from the other Kevin on our team about doing multiple frameworks. And there's a lot of detail around how that works and where you would use it. And then if this is something that you really want, um, go check out these tickets uh, from the Kotlin team. I don't know when they're gonna work on them, if ever, <clears throat> but these tickets are around like supporting multiple frameworks in the way you would want. Um, and I'm honestly not sure how they're going to do it, but they're there, so go vote for them. So, uh, binary size, another common question. What is adding Kotlin going to do to your app? Um, the summary is it's generally okay, but it's a little complicated. So, we did a bunch of tests around this, and there's a long overdue blog post. Uh, I don't know when we're going to get to it. There's a lot of detail in there. And, um, the summary is with simple logic. If you just have logic, like no libraries, maybe a couple strings, that's it. Um, you can assume about 150K on the download and a 500K on disk. This is what it's going to do incrementally on top of what's already in your app <clears throat> for like a simple Swift app, right? Um, camp kit, if we just add the camp kit into a, 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 like a blank app, it's going to do this to your things like one meg on disk or sorry, one meg download, four meg on disk. And that's like including KTOR, SQLite, light coin, stately, you know, some database tables, some logic. It's kind of a rough ballpark of what you can expect. Right. Um, so we did this thing where we generated a bunch of very simple classes and said, what happens to the binary? Like what's the Delta if we add these, and then measure the size of the resulting app. And if you look, um, essentially, Kotlin and Swift, as you add more classes, if they're very simple classes, you know, I don't know what it's gonna do in other cases, um, it's like a very linear add, so it's not bad. Um, but we started this exploration because somebody sent to us like, we added a bunch of Kotlin and it's terrible. <laughs> and our first tests looked like this, where as you added, it was certainly not linear. And um, well, it's linear, I guess, I don't know. anyway, it's bad. Like Kotlin was way bigger. So uh, in very short summary, um, this is what is going on. At a binary level, Kotlin itself and Swift itself, they're actually very similar, they're very static languages. Um, so Kotlin and Swift, the binary is like, let's say roughly that size for a class, but Kotlin needs to generate an iOS interface to be visible to your Swift code. Uh, unfortunately, Objective-C is not a very static language <laughs> and includes a bunch of stuff which actually makes the binary size uh, significantly bigger, right? And as you start adding a bunch of classes, you know, you start adding a bunch of those interfaces and you wind up with this delta that we showed earlier. So what do you do? Uh, well, you can mark them internal and then you just tell, like, if your iOS app only really needs to communicate with a few things, you wind up not having to include everything. Um, and that really cuts down on the size or if we're back to here where we had like this umbrella framework, you generate next code. Uh, if you want to be a little verbose, you could write sort of a, an iOS adapter interface that only exposes the things you're going to need and that would reduce it too. But, um, this is all kind of new information to us too, because we just kind of saw this, uh, relatively recently. So our best practices kind of a work in progress, still working on it. 
um, we got contacted by a very well-known, <laughs> very, very large consumer app that was very concerned about the size it was going to add. So that's what kind of triggered this. But uh, for the most part, TLDR, if somebody asks, I would say that's the simple answer. So, um, and then I guess the coming up stuff, direct swift interrupt, maybe 2021. It is in there like timeline, but it's not coming by March. And certainly the team is talking about it. Um, the good thing is people really ask for this and I think it might help a touch with performance. It might actually solve that size problem. Uh, but the thing I would say against this is it's not going to make Kotlin into Swift. They're different languages. So you're not going to get structs. You're not going to get enums with associated values. Um, it's actually going to make generics more complicated, which is a long story. I'm going to talk about that sometimes. So, um, it might be good, but some people are kind of waiting for this to like solve all the problems and it won't, <coughs> but we'll see how it goes. So um, summary is this is still early adopter ish. There are certainly people adopting it. It's alpha and one four, you know, we'll see how things go. Um, but you know, it's certainly production usable, uh, but there's still some, some things to solve, right? Uh, what's coming in 2021. I'm wildly guessing here, but uh, the compiler plugin stabilization is going to, introduce a lot of possibilities for libraries that weren't available. So mocking, you know, some kind of dagger like thing. We'll see how it goes. Uh, a more solid IDE and tooling support experience. Um, looking forward to that post alpha GA, maybe, um, proper web assembly. They took that out of Kotlin native and they're building a special compiler. Uh, if you care about that, we'll see how it goes. I feel like the world, I really cared about that and the world just kind of, uh, took a nap on WebAssembly, so we'll see. Um, new memory model, obviously, just don't know really when, and um, way more library support. These things are um, progressing, and I think the pace is, is increasing. So um, it's getting a lot better as time goes on, certainly. We've been like doing a lot of expect actual in, in our apps, and then happily pulling stuff out when somebody does a really good library for that. So it's been, been fun to watch. And uh, Compose for iOS, eh. Probably not 2021, but we'll see how it goes. Anyway, uh, the most important thing you can take away from this is join the Kotlin Slack. We're all there. JetBrains team is there. A bunch of people are all trying to solve the same problems uh, in a very helpful community. And that's it. That's me uh, and very important message. We are, I still have to, get, <laughs> we have to get the jobs up on the website. We are looking for, you know, mid-level plus folks who are very interested in mobile and want to learn about this tech. And, and slower alert look, but we're looking for uh, more super experts in Kotlin multi-platform if interested to join the team. Okay. Uh, wow. Got less than two minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, look at my horrible desktop. Let me stop sharing. Uh, all right. So um, we could have mute. Do we have a question? Uh, uh, so I ask here, are you aware of any plans to bring KMP to Roku? I, you know, not off the top of my head. Um, I assume that Roku is some flavor of, of Linux, um, something along those lines, maybe an embedded kind of ARM style processor. And uh, it, if there's demand there, they can do it. You know, the LLVM has been, been pushing out to a bunch of different platforms. I don't know off the top of my head, to be honest with you, though. I really spent almost all my time trying to make it work on, on the iPhone. Anybody else have questions? We can open the mics <laughs> if we want. Um, give it its momentum and maturity. It looks like a reasonable bet. Why would anyone wait for KMP? Well, you don't have to wait, number one. Number two, uh, Flutter is an entirely separate technology that solves an entirely different problem. Uh, three, if you have existing apps uh, and you don't want to rewrite them, Flutter is not a great choice, I guess. Um, four, we get into conspiracy theory land. I think Google is very invested in Android support. I don't know how long iOS support is going to be something they want to do. But that's conspiracy theory land. I apologize. Um, I don't know. I think the momentum of Flutter uh, is hard to measure. If you look at the GitHub stars, then it's going to be more popular and react at some point than not to do this in the future, but that seems unreasonable. So <laughs> like, 
uh, you know, how popular is it? There is certainly some momentum, but I think a Flutter fan might be led to believe that Flutter is going to essentially displace a lot of the industry. And I don't think that that's true. I'm not saying KMP will either, but KMP is less risky. You can do a database library. You can do just the analytics. You can do everything below the UI. And those are all reasonable possibilities. React Native and Flutter and anything that requires you to essentially write in that technology by its own, uh, it requires, a, I think, a riskier proposition. But whatever, you know. Um, flow work with IOMP, I'm sorry. How does things like Flow work on iOS with KMP? Um, uh, in a similar way to how they work on Android? I don't know how to answer that question. Like, um, generally, if we're using SQL Delight, let's say, in an app, if we have, we're watching database changes, we just subscribe by flow to the database changes in the same way you would do on Android. Native coroutines definitely does not, it's not as flexible as it is on the JVM, and that's going to be a while. Um, so, but you can use it in like sort of the straightforward ways. I think what you want to avoid is like really complicated um, canceling a bunch of child processes and doing all this stuff. Uh, that, that's actually part of the issue that um, Roman ran into trying to implement with that concurrency model. And I think that that largely accelerated why the concurrency model is going away, but that's a lot of speculation. <laughs> all right. Got any other questions? All right. Great. Well, everyone, thank you very much.